Good evening and welcome to Cupertino Insight. My name is Dorothy Cornelius. I'm Cupertino's city clerk and the host for this program. Tonight we'll visit the city's service center, drop by the mayor's luncheon, and talk about the five-year capital improvement program, as well as take a peek at the new production of the Cupertino Junior Players. Here with me in the studio to talk about that capital improvement program are Bert Viscovich, the Director of Public Works, and on his right, Blaine Snyder, the Director of Finance for the city. Welcome to Cupertino Insight, gentlemen. Thank you. I think we probably should start by finding out exactly what is a five-year capital improvement program. The five-year capital improvements program is a tool that's used in listing all the uh, capital projects that are to be undertaken by the city and prioritize these projects and to try to arrive at a, a dollar amount for these uh, different projects in the different years that will be scheduled. So it actually does include projects that would possibly be occurring during a five-year period. That's correct. Each year there's five years, the existing uh, year and five additional years and also we have unprogrammed projects which we feel that are needed or should be listed as a uh, reminder that these projects are needed, but that we do not have the capability of undertaking those because of financial constraints. I see. And what determines whether or not a project goes on that list? What it's done, what a five-year program does is, is list all the projects and then through the process of uh, uh, meetings uh, with the council, uh, the community, we determine the priorities of those projects. Uh, if, if it's traffic, we may find that these, these projects are needed in order to uh, mitigate a problem at the uh, different areas of the city. Uh, if there are parks, it's based on demands for the different neighborhoods as to how much park space is needed. All these priorities then are, are listed and most of these projects may have to compete against one another, such as a transportation improvement with a park acquisition or a land acquisition project. Uh, but f with the funding capabilities of the city, most of these projects seem to have found a, a space in the next five years to be implemented. There are, however, still some unprogrammed projects that are left uh, un undecided as to which year, and that's mainly because of unknown or uncertainty as to whether these projects should be undertaken based on general planning of the city. I see. Well, obviously, then, funding is one of the considerations when determining these projects. Blaine, that's more or less <laughs> what you're here to talk about. What are the sources of funding that the city uses for these projects? Well, Dorothy, what we use uh, with funding for the capital improvement program, the major source is really general fund revenues. Uh, we also use gas tax monies, storm drain funds, we use uh, revenue sharing and where possible environmental impact funds. <clears throat> the general fund being the largest uh, revenue of the city of Cupertino is really comprised of, of uh, property tax, sales tax, it uh, consists of uh, user fees and oftentimes people when they look at the funding of uh, the various programs or projects within a city, they look at a city and say, gee, there's a lot of money there. One thing that's critical to understand in funding a capital improvement program that only certain funds can be used for certain types of projects. For example, our gas tax uh, uh, fund makes up for about 4.3 percent, I believe it is, of the capital improvement program. The gas tax funds that come from the state of California through their state subvention process is restricted for street kinds of activities. Street lights, curbs and gutters, street overlays, and these kinds of things. You have revenue sharing funds that are used in the uh, capital improvement program that uh, comes from the federal government through uh, grants that we receive. The storm drain fund is funds that are collected through developers that come into the city and put in new developments. They do have to pay fees. And these f funds are restricted for the development of storm drains and cannot be used any other place in the city. Environmental impact 
is uh, a source that uh, through contract in the development of the Balco uh, shopping center, we obtain a certain amount of funds every year that is used within the uh, environment of Valco Park. And that is the makeup of our funding for the capital improvement. I see. And what percentage of the total budget is the capital improvement program? Well, the, the last year, last fiscal year, the 82-83 uh, fiscal year, it was 19% of the total budget. For the fiscal year that we're currently in, it's 22%. Now, based on the projections of the five-year program that was recently passed by City Council, or reviewed, I should say, by City Council, the capital improvement uh, budget amounts to 32 percent. So we are increasing the uh, amount of expenditure for our programs. I see. And is this approved as part of the regular budget process every year? Or? The, the fiscal year concern, for example, the five-year program goes out to fiscal year 88-89. The only fiscal year that we address in our annual budget process come June will be the fiscal year 84-85. I see. And Bert, I know, do know that the program is divided in different categories. About what percentage of the money goes to these categories and what are they? Okay, as you can see, the categories that we have in the, in the program are buildings and grounds, uh, street improvement projects, parks and land acquisition, uh, traffic signals and medians and overpasses. The majority of these expenditures seem to be in the streets and buildings and grounds. Uh, the parks are, are large in our five-year program today because of some large acquisitions of land. And then the remaining amount of uh, uh, dollars spent will be in the traffic signal installation modifications and the remaining medians and overpasses that have to be completed. What are some of the projects that are coming up in our current five-year program? Okay, so some of the projects that may have be may have be of some interest to the community are the signal installation and traffic improvements. Uh, one in particular is the Stevens Creek Boulevard and Foothill Boulevard, which has had uh, a lot of attention in the past and a lot of requests on why the signal hasn't been installed. Uh, the reason for that delay. Uh, and now it's been programmed for next uh, fiscal year, is that through our general plan process, we want to determine whether a signal in that location would encourage more commute traffic. And we have found that Foothill Boulevard really doesn't carry enough commute traffic that this signal would really encourage additional traffic. So that will be scheduled for next year, as well as the intersection widening in order to incorporate the new signal. Uh, the widening of Foothill Boulevard is another one since we're in that area and presently Foothill Boulevard is widened approximately 90% uh, of its entire length between uh, uh, 280 and Stevens Creek but there remains a couple areas that need to be widened to complete the project. Uh, one is at Poppy Drive where there are two homes that are presently owned by the city and rented. These homes will be removed and, a, and the road would be widened. At the same time when the road becomes widened, there will be a large median installed to try to uh, reduce the width of that roadway. Uh, Is it going to be planted so it's yes, it will have like a, the rest of it? Yes, it will have a kind of a natural uh, median look to it. Uh, the road is large, and that's because in, in previously there was a plan uh, for a larger uh, density in the hillsides, and since then the, the city has reduced its general plan and no longer is needed. Uh, another one is the purchase of the surplus uh, properties uh, that are now up for sale by the uh, Cupertino School District, one being the Jollyman site and the other being the Hoover. In both cases, the city will not acquire any of the uh, buildings. It will only acquire the vacant area, uh, six acres at Jollyman and another five acres at Hoover. Okay. Once the, cap once the council approves the capital pro improvement program, does it leave any flexibility, or is this more or less cast in concrete for that year? For that one year, it is the, uh, it's the uh, approved five-year portion that we do incorporate in the budget, and that then becomes our working document for the following year. Uh, the five-year program beyond next year is really a planning tool and could be modified 
uh, which it does on a yearly basis as priorities change. I see. All right. Now, I realize there's public hearings during the initial process as part of the budget hearings, I'm sure. But these are fairly major projects. And when it comes time to implement them, is there another public hearing, or has has that been done just with the budget process? Well, two things can happen, Dorothy. One is a project that may not be of any kind of con uh, uh, environmental impact, and others that may have to be assessed through an environmental impact procedure. These are assessed prior to construction, and if they do require additional work, additional hearings will be conducted. But in most cases, uh, they do not require additional uh, public hearings. Okay. I want to thank both of you very much for being here with me tonight. We got, I think we got a lot of good information out to the public. Good. As you may have noticed, a large portion of the capital improvement program is devoted to projects that are not only practical and necessary, but also contribute to making the ci city look really beautiful. Recently, the inside cameras went up to the Cupertino Service Center and we talked with Bob Batello, Public Works Superintendent. It's Bob and the people who work with him that keep Cupertino looking good. It's about 50% of the total budget of the city. And our department, the service center, is about 40% of that. Mm -hmm. That's spent on all the services of the city, which uh, again into this, the, the uh, streets department and the grounds department is our main divisions. And off of that, there are several departments or divisions off of that. And it consists of all the vehicles, uh, all the lighting from the city, all the sidewalk curb and gutter, uh, all the streets, everything that you basically see out there, our department takes care of the maintenance of the city. Mm -hmm. We have our own uh, system, our own wells, and our own water department, uh, which Ken McKee is the superintendent of. He has uh, three people that work with him, and we maintain our own meters read our own meters and our own water systems. Mm -hmm. The biggest challenges right now are our street sweeping, the street lighting. Uh, we're having a new program on that where we have now we've started a contractual service for the street sweeping. Uh, our own program for street lighting uh, we started this year in full force and it seems to be working out very well. The program for the street lighting is that we have numbered every pole and those numbers have gone into a computer. All complaints that come in from the public are put into the computer, and we do those immediately. What I mean by immediately is we go out and take a look at it to see if it's the reason why it is not functioning, try to get it fixed right away. If not, then we can even hire a contractor to come in and do some of the real major and, and uh, heavier things that we cannot do. Uh, the program, as far as uh, numbering them, works out very well for the public because they can see the poll the light that's out, see the pole and the number on the pole and just give us that number and then we can go right to that light instead of before where we used to guess a little bit. They'd say uh, so many from this corner, so much from this corner or by my house to the left or the right and we basically could not go out and work on the light because we have to go out at night to see which one it was. Now we can go out during the day and work on the light. The street sweeping, I would like to have a, um, a little bit more input from the community on uh, some of the reasons why um, the cars that are left out. They seem to know that their day is a certain day of the, of the month in which to be swept, but they still leave their cars out. We would like to have a little bit more input of why. Don't they have enough room you know, for their cars in their driveways, or are they not theirs? A lot of them have called and said they're not theirs. They belong to somebody else. They don't know who. It's not their neighbors, so they're kind of like derelict the vehicles. And we can have those towed away. We can have them marked, ticketed, and then after a certain amount of time, towed away. So if they would let us know that, uh, it would help us a great deal. Mm -hmm. If the streets do not have the vehicles that are on it in our way when we're, when we're sweeping, we can save a block an extra five minutes because he can just go three or four miles an hour straight not having to weave in and out. When he weaves in and out, he misses and has to slow down and has to speed up and he has to be very careful not to hit the vehicle, of course, so it slows him down. And we figure on an average day that it's about an hour of wasted time because of vehicles. Park maintenance can consist of several things. One, I think the one we'll be taking a look at is be the lawn mowing, the edging, um, 
the cleanup, general cleanup of a park, and that is done in a, in a series of cutting, of course, cutting the lawn, because that's what makes the mess. Then we edge the lawn afterwards, and then when that is all finished, of course, we clean up after ourselves, put everything away, and go to the next park. Major complaints right now are the street lighting. We get, uh, I'd average about two calls a day on street lights, whether intermittent, uh, completely off, or they've been shot out, um, or you know, vandalized, I should say, more than, more than being shot out, because vandalism consists of a lot of, a lot of things. You can have it, it can be done by a, a gun, it can be done by a rock, it can be done by just hitting it with a vehicle, and we call that vandalism. Uh, that is our major, uh, right now, our major complaint. Now coming into the warm weather, of course, will be the weed problems. We'll have a lot of complaints from neighbors calling on, on uh, neighbors on empty lots that uh, have not been weeded yet and they're afraid of fire hazard. Uh, our trees will be coming up shortly. They're starting to blossom now, so you'll have major, uh, not major complaints, but complaints on trees. The heaviness of the limbs now with all the weight on them and they're too low for walking in the sidewalks. That's what we will pick all that up in the summertime. And that's where our major programs are in the warmer uh, time of the years. People uh, in the city of Cupertino help us a great deal. They're kind of the, the extra set of eyes for us. I've heard from other um, sources that they wish that the citizens wouldn't get involved so much, but we're kind of happy here in the city of Cupertino. They do get involved, and they're usually right. I don't mean 100%, uh, but 99% of the time they're right. The tree does need trimming, or the, uh, the weeds do need to, to be taken out, or we do need to put a sidewalk in. They're very good. Several emergencies, emergencies can come up in a day. One is any spill, such as a chemical spill or a dirt spill, gravel spill, out into our roads. Those we do immediately. We can respond to anything within 15 minutes as far as picking up the gravel, as far as picking up the chemical that is spilled. That's a different story. Uh, Chemical-wise, we have to get the fire department involved and the police department involved. The gravel, we can cone it all off. We can be there with our men and it takes another about 15 minutes for a tractor to come, the loaders to come, tr uh, trucks come to get rid of it. But we can uh, make it safe for people within 15 minutes any place in the city of Cupertino. Mm -hmm. I believe the one reason we can respond so quickly is that we've all been here for quite a long time. We know the area real well. Uh, we used to talk about we're like the fire department. We know where we're going and so we can get there the quickest and respond. We have all of our tools set up in vehicles. Our emergency tools daily are in vehicles. We have emergency vehicles, uh, emergency. It's set up for emergencies. I believe the service center itself, the people. We have 32 people that work here, and I'm very proud of all 32 people. We work as a team. Uh, most of us have been around with each other for 12 or 13 years, and I think that's what makes us uh, a happy team here. We seem to want to be with each other. We seem to want to come to work every day and we seem to not care uh, of the special projects or the emergencies. As a matter of fact, I think we here enjoy them. We don't, uh, none of us here are the people I've worked with, none of us are just uh, uh, nine to five type people and stuff like that. I really believe that they enjoy the, the, uh, the uh, oh, the change, uh, knowing that it's, they're not going to just be working on a street for the rest of their life. They might be doing buildings, they might be doing water, they might be doing grounds, they might be doing uh, street, sidewalk, curb, and gutter. And I think it's a joy to come to work. I know it is for me, and I know I can, I can vouch for my staff in the, in the office that they all enjoy coming to work. Thanks to everyone at the Service Center for doing such a great job. And since we're talking about maintenance around the city as a whole, it seems appropriate at this time to talk about the maintenance of one of Cupertino's landmarks, De Anza College. Here in the studio tonight is Tom Clemens from the Foothill De Anza Community College District. Welcome to Cupertino Insights, Tom. Nice Thank to have you, you here. On Tuesday, April the 10th, the voters in this district will be asked to approve Measure A, which is a special tax on real property. Recently, the Cupertino City Council did endorse this measure. Why is the college district requesting a special local tax? Well, for since about June 1978, uh, our operational funds have been reduced about 25 percent. At the same time, we were requested, or really had to, continue the same enrollment of our student body. So during that time period, we were able to spend less and less money on capital equipment and deferred maintenance. 
So at the present time, we have something in excess of $5 million in deferred maintenance alone. We have every roof leaks. Uh, we have a lot of our equipment, which is outmoded and obsolete. And we simply want to maintain our quality institution, which Cupertino has every reason to be proud. That's true. Didn't the state recently provide adequate funding, though, for the colleges? Glad you asked that question. <laughs> no, they did not. Uh, we're, uh, we're very concerned that people are confused about that because the state did, at least in the governor's budget, include 30 percent increase in, in funds for the state college system, university system, and 21 percent for the state college system. What they did for the community colleges is return back what they took away last year. Oh. So we are at zero percent increase <laughs> since 1982. And, and there has been inflation. There <laughs> has been indeed. We actually get less money, 12 percent less money per student than the uh, San Jose Unified School District, which recently went bankrupt, to give you some measure of that. That gives me a clue, right. What about student tuition? You will be able to charge tuition now. Won't that help enough? Well, again, uh, the answer, I'm afraid, is no. Uh, our board went on record as being in favor of tuition last October to, to uh, break the deadlock in Sacramento between the two parties. What has happened is the tuition has been approved. It will start in fall quarter 1984. And we'll receive about $2 million in the first year. What is not widely known is that the state at the same time uh, declared 10 of our permissive fees illegal. So we are losing $1,800,000 while we're gaining $2 million in tuition. So our net to our district is about 200000 for next year at this moment. And just to give you a feeling about that, it takes about a million, too, just to maintain our, our current place as far as salary schedules and benefits mm -hmm. and utilities. So we actually we will have a $1 million fewer dollars next year than, than the current year. Oh. What would the funds derived from Measure A be used for? What kinds of things? They are restricted. They cannot be used for salaries. They're restricted to uh, deferred maintenance, such as roofs. And as I mentioned, and probably every roof on both campus leaks currently. Our sprinkler systems, our, all of our utility systems on campus would be a good part of that. We, uh, about half of it we want to go into instructional equipment. Uh, we are older now. The answer started in 1967 and Foothill in 1961. And a lot of our equipment is simply uh, old and outdated and obsolete. So we think we have close to $15 million of expenditures to get our quality programs back up to state of the art. I see. Now, what's the bottom line for the taxpayer? What is it really going to cost the property owner? Well, a property owner, uh, such as myself, who, since I live in Cupertino, uh, the average uh, resident will pay $25 per year flat. It is a property tax that's on square footage. So if you have a quarter acre lot, which is 10,000 square feet or less, you'll pay $25 per year for a period of four years. It cannot go up but it can go down if the state becomes enlightened enough to give us more money so that our <laughs> local board can either reduce or eliminate the local tax. So then it's not property tax in the traditional sense since it's not based on assessed value. No, it's not an ad valorem tax, which is specifically illegal since the Jarvis mm -hmm. Scan Initiative. And this particular measure is not anti-Jarvis. We want to make that very clear to people that what it is is it follows the exact guidelines set up by Jarvis and Gann which requires two-thirds majority for a local community to make a decision to uh, do better by their own school districts. Right. If Measure A passes, and let's assume it does, let's does this tax go on forever? Is, does the voter has an, uh, have the opportunity to repeal it? Does it automatically die after a certain period of time? I mentioned a moment ago that it lasts four years initially. Uh, we talked to people about having a sunset clause where it would automatically terminate after five years. And most people were suspicious of that. They preferred to have it go back to the voters after a period of four years and be voted in or out by a simple majority. So after four years, it must. It's mandated to go back to the people and can be voted out by a simple majority, while it requires two-thirds to be voted in initially on that's, April 10th. That's unique. I've never heard of that kind of a measure before. Well, I think it is fairly new, and we're trying to be responsive to our community because those ideas to do this came from our community members. All right. Why should the voters say yes to Measure A? What benefits will they derive? Well, I think their somewhat biased answer to that is that our uh, two colleges are worth approximately $150 million. 
they are uh, tremendous uh, institutions. They are a, a social and recreational center in our communities. Uh, what this will do is afford primarily better equipment for our students. That's the main reason we exist. And it will uh, protect and support our remarkably fine plants and hopefully the quality of our overall program for Cupertino. Oh. I think the college is doing a marvelous job and Cupertino is really very proud of De Anza. Well, so. thank you. We're very proud of Cupertino. Oh, I thank you. <laughs> I want to thank you very, very much for being here tonight. And good luck on April 10th with Measure A. Make sure everyone votes yes. <laughs> At least get out and vote, please. <laughs> uh, many things contribute to a community to make it a pleasant and desirable place to live. Certainly maintenance, um, attractive medians, nice structures, uh, beautiful plantings. But beyond these tangible things, are the arts, music, and theater. Boy, I never knew you could do so much with hamburger until I came to camp. <laughs> That looks like fun. And here with me in the studio is Susan Shear, the producer of that particular show, and the Cupertino Junior Players. Welcome to Cupertino Insight. Hi. Susan, what is the Cupertino Junior Players? Um, it's a relatively new group. We're about two and a half years old. It's a community theater for children. It's uh, open to kids 8 to 18, and we usually get a pretty good mix of, of that age range. Do you always do musicals or We have so things? far always done musicals because they sell better. We would like to do other things. Uh, so far, they've, that's what we've done. And what is the name of your current offering? House of Tomorrow. And who wrote it? 
It was written and conceived by uh, a young man from Los Altos named Scott Williams, who produced it, actually developed it with a group of kids at Sunnyvale's Junior Theater four years ago. <clears throat> and we took it in, said, really like the show, but we want to do it uh, basically the same way, but take our group of kids and put their feelings, their experiences into as much as we can. And that's what we did. So it's the whole thing is has been local right from its inception. Very That's much so. Terrific. When and where does it open? Well, Big anyway, key yeah. question. It opens <laughs> April sixth at Madsen Theater, uh, Monta Vista High School. Um, that's a seven thirty show. We go two weekends, close on the fifteenth. Um, Saturday and Sundays are two o'clock matinees. And uh, I think it's going to be a good show. It's it's exciting. It has a lot to say about kids growing up, about teenage uh, feelings, um, and basically uh, still in a setting of a summer camp with a, a kind of a storyline and a lot of fun. Uh, so it's a mixture of, of s s something thoughtful, uh, meaningful, some tender moments, some uh, very fun moments. It's a, I think it's going to be interesting. Would it give the whole thing away if you just gave us a little touch of the storyline? <laughs> well, the story is basically that the kids come, 38 kids come to camp and meet each other and, um, and then experience different, different um, uh, kinds of things and share moments, share feelings, and end, at the end of the show, we see them with the slide presentation going back home and taking with them some of the experiences they've had and, and, um, and going off with that. Now that we would all like to run out and get tickets oh, and see the show, I'll where do we get tickets? We are sponsored by <laughs> Cupertino Parks and Recreation, and you can call that office 253-2060, um, or you can call 245-4050, and we will sell you tickets. <laughs> oh, thanks a lot for being here today. Oh, thank you. It sounds terrific. I think I really will get a ticket. Okay, good. <laughs> As you are undoubtedly aware by this time, there are lots of things going on in Cupertino. The big question is, is how does the mayor and the council and everyone be aware of everything at the same time? One way to keep track of them is through our mayor's once a month luncheon. <laughs> every, every month, the mayor gets together with members of the various commissions and members of st city staff. The whole purpose of this brown bag lunch is a sharing of information. The mayor goes over the actions the council has taken at their last meetings, and each commissioner lets us know what's going on in that group. And speaking of council actions, at their meeting of the 27th, council approved the dissolution of the Solid Waste Management Authority and also approved assigning a landfill site agreement with the city of Mountain View. I want to thank all of you for watching Cupertino Insight tonight, and please stay tuned for your city council. <laughs>